today we're going to talk about how we discovered how big the universe is. So this is part of the story of cosmology, and cosmology, as most of you know, is an enormous story. Um, the last time we did this, we talked about the the way the universe cooled down and created all the stuff that we're made of. Uh, so if you go back to the slides from the last time we did the class, you'll see that that story in there. And so this is another part of the story, which is how did we actually figure out that the universe was as big as it is? And in a couple of weeks, we'll talk about dark matter and dark energy, which is what most of the universe is made of. So we'll have some more of the cosmology story, okay? But today, we're just going to focus on how did we figure it out? How did we understand, um, ultimately, how big the universe really was, okay? So um, I'll remind you all the web, uh, 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 all the slides for the class are on the web right there. Um, we've been recording them as well. So after the class, um, I go and I put the audio on top of the slides again. So you can go back and listen to it and stare at the slides one more time. Uh, but so what we'll do today then is we'll talk about what we do see, what we actually uh, observe when we go out into uh, look at the night sky. And from that kind of talk about why it is that we decided the universe works the way uh, we th thought it did. Um, and then we'll, we'll move on to the story of how do you actually measure distances. Because how you measure distances um, transforms the way we think about the structure and size of the universe. And as always, we can't tell this whole story, right? There's stuff we're going to leave out, and we could spend a whole you know, year talking about this. So if there's bits of this that you've heard, or other bits of it that you want to know about, please don't hesitate um, to chat, uh, chat with me about it. Okay? Okay, so this is how it all begins, right? We all go out and we stand outside under the night sky and we look at what happens around us. And so the question is, is when I stand on the earth and I look at the sky, what do I see happen if I go outside? The sky moves, okay, perfect. And which way does it move? Right, so, so it moves in the opposite way the Earth is moving, and you know that because you're a 21st century brain, and you've been taught that that's the way the universe moves, right? But if you didn't know that, if you just went out and you looked, and you said, based on what I see, what is the universe doing, right? Well, everything, everything rises in the east, it goes across the sky, and it sets in the west. The stars do it, the sun does it, the moon does it, the planets do it. Everything that we see starts in the east and moves in the west. And so when we first started thinking about the universe, when we started thinking about what we call cosmology that started thousands of years ago, this was what we thought about when we talked about the way the universe was structured. And if you go out on the floor, we have a display that shows this, right? Have you all seen this? Okay, so this is in telescopes. If you go walk through the big Stonehenge arch, the very first thing you encounter in telescopes is this display. This is called the crystal sphere. And for 2,000 years of recorded history, this is the way we thought about the universe for 1,500 years. And so if you look at this, right, if you go look up close on this side, right, you'll see the Earth is here in the middle, and there's this ordering of things that goes from the moon, Mercury, Venus, Sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and the stars. But they're in this particular order. How do we know it's in that order? Why is that the order that we think the universe was structured in? So let's start with the moon. The moon's probably the easiest. Why is the moon the closest thing to the Earth when I just look at things moving in the sky? It's the biggest. What else? What does it do that nothing else on that list does? It lights up the planet, but it does one other very important thing. It has phases, but it goes in front everything else in that list. The moon's the only thing that goes in front of the stars. It's the only thing that goes in front of the sun. It goes in front of the planets. There's very famous pictures. If you go, if you Google moon occultation Saturn, you'll see pictures of Saturn disappearing behind the moon, right? So when I'm thinking about the universe and I'm thinking everything's going around the Earth, based on only what I can see, it's clear the moon's the closest thing because it goes in front of everything. And so that led to this kind of idea that there's these crystal spheres that everything we're attached to. And based on how I see things move, that determines the order they went in the sphere. But always, 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 the stars were the farthest things out. 
They were the only thing that never changed. They were the only thing that never moved with respect to everything else. The constellations stayed the same, but the planets moved through the stars, the sun moved through the stars, the moon moved through the stars. But the stars were always the farthest thing from us. And so when we started thinking about the way the universe would work and we started changing our ideas about the universe, the goal ultimately is to explain what's the deal with the stars. This is where it really started to transform the way we started thinking about the universe. It actually started in about the third century BC with a guy named Aristarchus of Samos. Aristarchus is the one who really first started thinking about the stars and the structure of the universe. And we don't have his original book, but his book is referred to in other books that we still have from that era in history. But it is known, it's been described, that he had worked out and convinced himself that the sun was at the center of the solar system. That that whole crystal sphere structure with the earth at the middle and everything on the way out wasn't right. And that the sun should be at the middle and everything else was on the side. But the fall of classical civilization kind of erased all of that. And it took us as part of Western culture another 1,500 years to rediscover that idea. And it was put forward by a man called Copernicus. And this is out in front, right? Let's go out in front and see our big statue. Copernicus. Now, the interesting thing about Copernicus is if you go read his book, he says, you know, look, I've thought of this great idea that the that the uh, you know sun is at the center of the universe and the moon and the earth and everything goes around the sun. Okay, and he presents it in in the revolutions as if he thought of it. But we happen to have an old copy of the first manuscript that he wrote about this. And in that manuscript he says, Oh, Aristarchus thought of this 1,500 years ago. But in the published version, he didn't write that in. Really, this is who, uh, these are the two guys that uh, we associate with this transformation of this idea that maybe the crystal spheres aren't the right way to be thinking about the universe. Okay? But in the end, the stars are still far away. If you look at the way Copernicus and Aristarchus described it, the stars are still the thing that are infinitely far away. And they say, they must be infinitely far away because we don't see them move the way we see everything else. So still, even though we're transforming the way we think about the universe's structure, it's still the uh, name of the game is trying to figure out how far away the stars are. Let's talk about how you measure the distances of stars. Okay, so this is a follow-along activity. So I have a set of dots up there. Okay, and the first thing I want you to do is I want you to take your index finger, doesn't matter which hand. Okay, and hold it as far away from your arm as you can, okay? And close your left eye and point to one of the dots on the left, okay? Now, your left eye should be closed. Is that left? Yeah, okay, I'm a little dyslexic to my left or right, okay? Now, close your right eye and open your left eye, and what happens to your finger? It moves to another circle, okay? Now, pay attention to which colors you move between, okay? So if I start on red and I do that, my uh, that jumps over to the green circle. Okay, now hold your finger six inches from your face and do the exact same thing. Okay, so point at the star or, or the star, they're not stars, they're circles. Okay, and close your eyes. And what happens? It moves farther. Okay, so this is what we call parallax, it's a way of measuring distances based on how things appear to be in different locations in the sky when you move. Okay, and so the easiest demonstration you can do here is just with your finger, okay? But the point is, is that if something moves really, really far in the sky, it's closer to you. And if it moves a little far, little distance in the sky, it's much, much farther away from you. So we can do this with stars, right? And so the way we do this with stars is we look at stars at two times during the year. One time when the Earth is on one side of the sun, and then it moves all the way to the other side, and then we look at the star again. So this is like opening your left eye, and then opening your right eye. So you look with your left eye, and you see the star in one direction in the sky, and then six months later, you look with your other eye, and you see the star in another direction in the sky. But if the star is far away, it only jumps this little angle represented by this yellow redshift. But if the star is much, much closer, it jumps by a much bigger angle, this purple one. So this is, this is a geometrical method for determining how far away things are. 
let's think about the practicality of doing this, right? This was worked out. The Greeks knew how to do this, okay? They could figure this out. So what's the closest star to the sun? Anyone know? No? It's, yeah, Proxima Centauri, or Alpha Centauri is the one that we can see with our eye, okay? That's this star right here. Um, you can't see it from Evanston, but if you go south to Florida and uh, southern Arizona, uh, it will certainly rise above the horizon. It'll be up in the middle of the night in about February or March. Okay, so uh, Alpha Centauri is 4.3 light years away. So traveling at the speed of light, it takes four and a quarter years to get there. Okay, so if you were to do this thing that I just told you, this parallax, where I look at Alpha Centauri in March, and then I look again in September. How far does it move in the sun? Anyone know? Want to guess? It's a tiny number. <laughs> okay, so it moves two ten thousandths of a degree. Okay, now how many of you have used a protractor in, in right? So those little marks are degrees, and you divide those up into 10,000 of them. And that's how far Alpha Centauri moves on the sky doing this parallax. Okay, so you can't see it with your naked eye. If I were to do it physically, right, that's about the diameter of a quarter if it's about 4.2 miles away. That's how big it moves in the sky. Okay, it's exceedingly tiny. And so even though the Greeks had figured this out, they didn't have the technology for this. They didn't have telescopes, right? Even you and I going in my backyard with a telescope, this is really almost beyond our capability to see this stuff. Right? We could do it with a big enough telescope, okay? But it's really, really hard to do. So even with technology, this becomes exceedingly difficult to do. But we can do it. The real way we do it is we fly spacecraft. So um, there was a very famous uh, spacecraft about a decade ago called Harco. For those of you who pay attention, the Europeans used to do a mission called Gaia. And Gaia is now turning on, and this is what Gaia's entire purpose is, is to, from space, measure the parallax of as many stars as possible. And Gaia will measure the parallax about a million times. But you have to get above the Earth's atmosphere to do it, because the atmosphere makes it really hard. Okay? So this is the biggest, absolute, most difficult problem in the world, is how do you measure distances? Not because we can't think of clever ways to do it, because the distances are so enormous, are so large, that the technology needed to do it is really, really hard. So the obvious ways aren't always going to work. So we have to think of more clever ways to do it. Okay? And we have. Okay? So the first person to really think hard about this was uh, William Herschel. And in 1785, he had decided, I really want to understand what the size of the Milky Way is. We've you know, built telescopes. And one of the very first things Galileo did was he looked at the Milky Way and discovered it was full of stars. And so Herschel had decided that, well, if it's full of stars, I should be able to use that fact to determine how big the Milky Way really is. And so he used something called star gauges. Okay? So what he did was he went out with his telescope and he looked in every direction in the sky. And he said, I'm going to make the assumption that every star I can see should be exactly the same brightness if they were all held at a fixed distance. If I could gather them all up and line them up at the back of the room, they would all be exactly the same brightness. Okay? But not all the stars are the same brightness when you look at them in the sky. And he assumed that the reason was was because they were at different distances. Okay? So if you look here, this is two flashlights that I just took out in my backyard. Okay? And right here in the middle, the two flashlights are the same distance away. So they look roughly the same brightness. But if I take one flashlight and I bring it closer than the other one, it looks bigger in the photograph, which is an indicator that it's brighter. If I would actually do it, it would look brighter to you than the one in the photograph. Okay, and similarly, if I take it much, much farther away, it looks dimmer. So what Herschel said is he said, the brightness in the telescope tells me the distance. If I assume they all should look like this, they're all the same brightness. And then I look in the telescope and one's dimmer, I know it's much, much farther away. And based on how dim it looks, I can tell you how far away it is. Okay? And so when he did this, he created this map. So this was the very first map of the Milky Way ever made. Okay? The sun's location is right here. 
And if you look in different directions, he's put, I think each dot, I should look this up before class, but I won't. Something like it represents 500 stars he saw in his life. Okay, in that direction, and then the brightnesses um, tell you how far away he made the dots. You notice a big gap here, right? So that is the great rift in Cygnus in the Milky Way. If you go out away from Chicago <laughs> when it's dark, and you look in Cygnus, you'll see the Milky Way has this big fork in it, and that's the great rift. Yeah, did he account for sizes of stars, right? So in those days, they didn't know anything about stars. And so we had never seen the disk of another star. It's actually, I don't know whether or not we had decided the sun was a star or not. That's a good historical question. I don't know the answer to that. But, but we didn't know anything. We didn't know the stars were other sizes. We didn't know that they evolved and changed in time. Um, so I, my, my assumption is that he did not, because this, this is based on the idea that every star is exactly like every other star. Okay? Okay. So he wrote this very nice, if you go re read his uh, paper about this, he describes the Milky Way as being an extensive compound of many millions of stars, which mostly probably owes to its origin to many remarkably large as well as pretty closely scattered small stars that may have drawn together to us. And as a gravitational physicist, this is what I do in my research. We spend a lot of time trying to simulate the galaxy. Uh, this is the first uh, occasion that I know of someone kind of realizing that the galaxy was probably a system bound together by gravity and big bang theory. Okay, if you go out on the floor, we have a model of this. Okay, you see the big green galaxy out there uh, in the telescope. If you look on the back side of it, there's a mirror on this side, you'll see that we've etched the purchase of this model. Okay, see how it lines up with the disk of the galaxy. Okay? Okay. So that's great. We can measure the size of the galaxy. But at this time, even though Herschel drew it a little off center, right, that's just based on the fact that he was counting stars, he didn't really know where in the galaxy the sun was. Okay, so if I want to measure the size of the galaxy and I project the Copernican principle on the galaxy, just like the Earth's not at the center of the solar system, it seems reasonable that maybe the sun's not at the center of the galaxy. But we have to figure that out. How could you figure that out? Well, you have to be able to measure the distances to the stars that are in the galaxy. So the person who discovered how to do this is Henrietta Swan Leavitt. Her contribution, people will argue about this, but I think what she did, the story I'm about to tell you, is the single most important discovery ever made in astronomy. Because she's the one who taught us to really measure distances to the stars. So she was uh, a graduate of Radcliffe College, which was at that time, I don't know if they still are a women's college or not, but uh, it was the women's college at Harvard. She did not take astronomy until like her fourth year. Uh, she got an A minus in astronomy, so she did okay, right? Uh, but uh, she went to work at the Harvard College Observatory. She was part of a group of women who worked there known as the Harvard Computers. And she was put to work on something called stellar photometry. So that is measuring the brightness of stars. And in stellar photometry, um, the difficulty with photometry is you can measure the brightness of the stars all you want, but you can't determine anything about their distances unless you know something about where they are in the galaxy. And at this time, we had no idea how to measure distances to the stars. So she was looking at um, stars in a galaxy called the Large Magellanic Cloud. So if you go to the Southern Hemisphere, you'll see the Milky Way stretching up here. There's these two small clouds that are bright patches, just like the Milky Way was a bright patch. And if you look at them through the telescope, just like you look at the Milky Way in the telescope, you, they resolve themselves into individual stars. We didn't know at the time that they were other galaxies. We just thought they were clusters of stars that were part of the Milky Way. And so she was looking at stars in the Magellanic Clouds. And she made the following very important assumption, which was a good one to make. She said, all of these stars are in the Magellanic Clouds, so they're probably all exactly the same distance away from Earth for all intents and purposes. Okay, so that's beautiful, because that means when she looks at the stars in the images, if one's dimmer than the other, she knows it's really dimmer than the other because they're all held at a fixed distance. Like we said, if you wind them up in the back of the room, they're all the same distance away, and you can tell whether intrinsically they're brighter or dimmer than the other. And this is key to being able to solve the problem of distance. So in 1912, um, she, had, she had kind of been describing her work. She'd been working on this for like 
five or six years. <clears throat> and in 1912, she discovered something very important. Okay? When she was looking at all the stars in the Large Magellanic Cloud, she was looking at a group of them called Cepheid variables. So these are stars that get brighter and dimmer over time. It takes them about five days a week. They get bright, and then they get dim. And then they get bright, and then they get dim. So these are what we call pulsating stars. And the reason they're getting brighter, related to Natalie's question, the reason they're getting brighter is because they're getting bigger. So you're seeing more of the surface area of the star. So there's more bits of the star sending light at you. And then when they get dim, they shrink down a little bit. So there's less bits of the star sending and then they get brighter, they get dimmer, they get brighter, over and over again. What creates the light? So these are they're ordinary stars, just like the sun. So deep down in their core, there's nuclear fusion going on. And those nuclear explosions are producing all the energy that makes the star hot, that makes it glow. But there's something about the internal structure where those balances between all those nuclear explosions and gravity pulling in and the way stuff uh, circulates in the star that causes them to get brighter for a little while, and then they shrink, and then they get brighter. But it's still nuclear fusion down in the core. Okay, so these Cepheid variables um, get brighter and dimmer on a steady, um, steady, steady schedule. Now, she knows that they're all at the same distance. And so what she noticed was some of the Cepheids are always brighter than the others, and some of the Cepheids are always dimmer than the others. But they all still go up and down. And what she discovered is that the brighter the Cepheid was, then the longer it took to go up and down in brightness. Okay? So this is a very important observation because it means that you don't have to know the distance to the star to know how intrinsically, how bright it is in reality. All it means is I have to sit there with a stopwatch and time how long it takes to get brighter and dimmer. And if it takes a long time to get brighter and dimmer, I know it's intrinsically brighter, it's a 100 watt star. And if I know it takes only a little time to get brighter and dimmer, I know it's dimmer, it's a 40 watt star. And I don't have to know the distance. I can just tell you what the brightness is based on measuring this change in this star. Okay? So this was the big discovery. And so you basically measure how long it takes to change the brightness. That's the stopwatch part. Then you use Leavitt's rule to tell you what the true brightness of the star is. We call that the period luminosity relationship. I measure the period it takes to get brighter and dimmer, and I can tell you the luminosity, the true brightness of the star. Okay? Then I go look in my telescope and measure how bright the star actually looks from Earth. Because if it's close to Earth, it will look brighter. And if it's far from Earth, it'll look dimmer. But if I compare those two numbers, I get the distance. Yeah. So how do you measure the brightness? So so this was this was uh, right after the advent of photography, probably maybe 25 years or so. I don't remember. There, we know when the first astrophotograph was taken, but I don't remember when. Um, but um, on plates or photographs, when you expose stars, the brighter you are, the bigger the spot it makes on the plate. So you can measure brightness by just measuring the diameters of the plates. Okay? But the key here is that you have to have one of these cepheids that you actually know the true distance to to calibrate it. Okay? And that was done with parallax measurements like I was just showing you. So we knew how to calibrate it. Okay? So this was the game. If you can see a cepheid anywhere in the universe, you can measure the distance to it by this method. You don't have to have parallax. You don't have to have some uh, you know, ultra-precise telescopic measurement. All you have to do is have a stopwatch that can measure the change. It's, um, it's, it's not very complicated at all. It's about this long. It's a couple of numbers you multiply together, and then you have to take an exponential combination. Okay, so it's what astronomers call a power law. So it's very, it's very strict. Now, calibrating it is hard. Um, and in fact, part of the story that we're not going to talk about today is that part of the confusion early on with this is there's actually two types of cepheids that it works for. And at that time, they didn't know that. So sometimes they were making measurements with one set of cepheids, and sometimes they were making measurements with another set. And so that confused issues until we figured it out. But, but, but we know we've, that's been resolved. We understand that. It works quite well. 
so she she had she was the very first one to do it, and people almost immediately started using it. I mean, it went so well. Yes. There are other stars that have similar relationships, but these are the ones. These are the first ones. Ooh, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, they are not uncommon, but I don't know the, the actual fraction. That's a, that's a very good question. Um, we see them in plenty of star clusters. We see them in plenty of galaxies. So it's not like we're hunting around all the time for 70 of them. But I actually don't know the importance of it. You're probably right. Okay. Other questions? One of the very first people to do this was Har uh, to use this was Harlow Shapley. So Shapley at that time was the director of the Mount Wilson Observatory, which was the home of the largest telescope on the planet. So Mount Wilson had built the 60-inch telescope in the early 1900s, and immediately it was used for all kinds of awesome things. And by this time, uh, they were working on the 100-inch telescope, which plays a very important part in the story as well. And so Shapley was interested in the globular clusters. So like the Large Magellanic Cloud and like the uh, Small Magellanic Cloud, if you look at globular clusters in a telescope, it's clear that they're made of other stars. And galaxies like the Milky Way have several hundred of them. There's about 150 known in the Milky Way. We think there's another 50 that we haven't discovered yet or so that are behind the dust of the Milky Way that we can't see. But Shapley was interested in knowing where all of these were in relation to the galaxy. And so he went to pictures, just like this one, of all of the globular clusters that had been uh, seen. And he measured all the Cepheid variables he could find and used that to determine how far away the globular clusters were. And so then he made a map that showed the direction in the sky you look to the globular cluster and how far away it was, kind of just like Herschel's map of the galaxy. Okay? And so this is Shapley's original map. Here's a picture of it. Okay? I just told that story. So here's the sun. And here are the plots of the location of all of the globular clusters that Shapley observed. And you'll notice the sun's out here in an apparent dearth of globular clusters, and all of the globular clusters are clustered over here. And Shapley made the very quite reasonable assumption, based on our Copernican ideal, that the sun's probably not at the center of the galaxy. The galaxy is probably the dominant thing controlling everything in this part of the universe. And so the globular clusters must not be centered on the sun. They must be centered on the Milky Way itself. And so that X is the center of all of this cluster of globular clusters. And so that X must be the center of the Milky Way galaxy. So this was the first time we had ever made any kind of measurement that indicated where the sun was in the Milky Way. This is the first measurement of the distance to the center of the galaxy. Okay? He, he guessed that the Milky Way was just like we guessed that the sun's controlling the gravity in the solar system. He guessed that the Milky Way was controlling the gravity of everything in it. Yeah, and that was an assumption, absolutely. But today, we can make measurements that show everything orbits that way. But he was making that assumption because that's the measurement. Th those measurements at most had never been made. This is the uh, modern picture of the Milky Way. Okay, and where's the sun live? Does anyone know? Yeah, right, right where you're pointing. Right. <laughs> so it's it's about uh, twenty four thousand light years uh, or so away. Is that what I'm telling you? Okay, down here, out on the spur of one of these spiral arms. But the total distance across the galaxy, okay, we were discovering was enormous. A hundred thousand light years, or to put it in things that probably still don't mean anything to all of us, 588 quadrillion miles from one side to the other, <laughs> okay? So, so it was enormous. And one of, the, one of the funny things about the mindsets of astronomers at this time is that those numbers, they're huge to me and you. But today, you and I know of numbers and distances much, much larger. But at that time, these numbers were so enormous that astronomers couldn't imagine the universe was bigger than this. They thought this was the sum total of everything that the universe was. Okay? And so this is where the story is going to get a little bit different. 
this is a, a great example of this. So if you if you look at the at the the galaxy here, um, out uh, in the in the lower hallway, we have this picture taken in infrared light that scans across the galaxy on a line like this one here. Okay. So if you imagine you go out and you stand in front of that uh, uh, picture, we call it the glimpse survey, but the, it's an acronym for the Kennedy Observatory Galaxy, and think about from the perspective of the sun how far it is along every little bit on that glimpse survey. So I like to do that. So, so there's these little marks here on the end. And if you stand there and you stretch your arms out like this, you can basically reach from here over to here. So if you were at the center of the galaxy on the glimpse survey, and light left this point in the days of the Roman Empire, it would just now today be reaching this point. Okay? And so before we started being able to make measurements of the size of the galaxy, we didn't know that. But the numbers are blowing their minds, right? The galaxy's a freaking huge place. <laughs> and this is the kind of perfect demonstration of that. If you just go stand out there with your arms, it took the entire history of recorded civilization for light to travel that far, which is kind of crazy. At this time, we were building better and better telescopes, and we were taking pictures of the sky. And we were seeing all kinds of things in the sky that looked like this. So those of you who hang out with amateur astronomers like uh, I do, we call these fuzzy white things, right? Because they all look exactly the same, right? They're the kinds of things that if you get your spouse out of bed in the middle of the night and drag them out to the telescope, they're like, don't ever get me out of bed to see this again, okay? Some of them look cool, but most of them are just little fuzzy white things in, in front of them. Now, I'm showing you these two in particular because these are two very different objects, but they kind of look the same. They're both fuzzy and white. There's backgrounds of stars behind them, and they have these dark structures running through the middle of them. Okay. This one is called the Triffid Nebula, and you've probably seen pictures of this. It's uh, kind of blue and red, and it's got this kind of triangular dark lane going through it. That's the Triffid part of it. This one is called Centaurus A, and it's in uh, Centaurus, not too far in the sky from Alpha Centauri. Again, you can see it from Florida or Arizona. This is a nebula, a cloud of gas and dust in the uh, Milky Way. This was called a nebula in the early part of the 20th century, but it's really another galaxy. Okay? And so we didn't know the differences between galaxies and nebulae in the olden days. Okay? In fact, there was a whole class of these that we called the spiral nebulae. The Andromeda galaxy in those days was called the Andromeda Nebula. The Whirlpool galaxy was called the Whirlpool or the Pinwheel Nebula because we didn't know they were other galaxies, okay? And this is where all of the trouble started, okay? Because Immanuel Kant, who's a very famous uh, philosopher, in the 1700s had speculated that the Milky Way can't be the only galaxy. Just on philosophical grounds, right? Pushing that whole Copernican ideal. He's like, there must be other, he didn't use the word galaxy, he called them island universes elsewhere that are just like the Milky Way. Okay, now astronomers didn't pay a lot of attention to this, but it started the whole debate about the nature of the cosmos and what was the universe really, really like. Okay, but things kind of got heated up because people started building telescopes. So in 1845, William Parsons, who was the uh, uh, Earl of Ross, built this telescope. It's six feet in diameter. You can see a person standing there in the middle of it. It was called the Leviathan of Parsons Eye. Okay, and it was so big, the only way to move it was to mount it on the side of this castle wall and just lift it up and down using the castle for support. Okay, so all he could do is look south, look straight up overhead and a little bit farther north, but he couldn't, you know, look side to side. I keep trying to convince my spouse I need a telescope like this. She keeps laughing at me. Why do you big build, build bigger telescopes? So you can see farther, and what else? You can see more, you can see dimmer things, and smaller things. The very first thing that Ross started uh, studying was what was then called the Whirlpool Nebula, or M51. And this is his sketch of M51. It was the first time we had ever built a telescope that was big enough to see structure like this in one of these nebulae. This was the first detection of spiral structures in and so for reasons that are not clear to me, and I keep trying to understand this, and I haven't found a historical account that describes it, Parsons immediately decided 
this was an island of weakness. He took that old idea from Kant and said, clearly, this is an island of weakness. And this set astronomers off for uh, 60 or 70 years to come. Okay, So we started arguing incessantly about what was the nature of this island of weakness. So this is what he was looking at. This is a modern picture of it. Okay, So this is the, well, and you can see this in his, uh, in his picture, right? This is the small companion galaxy. Okay, so this is called the Whirlpool Galaxy, or M51. This is NGC 5195. So the gravity from the Whirlpool is slowly tearing this galaxy apart. Okay, and all of these stars are resulting in a hard dust core. If you go see it in the sky, if you find the Big Dipper, it's right underneath the last star in the M Big Dipper. And any average uh, amateur telescope today will show you the spiral structure of the light that they saw in the Dipper. So that tells you something about how telescopes were handled at a certain point, right? Their telescopes really sucked. They needed a six-foot telescope to see what you and I can see in a 10 or 12-foot telescope. You can't do it from Chicago, so you go out to where it's dark. This started a huge debate, okay? And the only way to resolve this debate, oh, sorry, well, let me tell you, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that, right? The debate was, are the spiral nebulae really island units? Are they other galaxies enormously far away? Or are they really just funny looking nebulas in the Milky Way? Okay, remember, I told you the mindset of astronomers was that 100,000 light years was enormous. It's huge. There's no way anything could be farther away than that because the universe would have to be ginormous beyond belief if these things were really island universes far, far away. Okay. How do you resolve debates like that? You gotta look again. And you have to do something different. You have to be able to measure the distances to the nebula somehow. Okay, so this is the game. Well, fortunately, Leavitt taught us how to do it. And the person who figured it out was Edwin Hubble. Uh, this is, uh, I just discovered this picture like a week ago. This is my favorite picture of Edwin Hubble in life because he's hanging out with his cat. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, and do you know what his cat's name is? Nicholas Copernicus. <laughs> okay, so this is a picture. This was Hubble's last cat. Uh, Hubble, Hubble died before his cat died. So it's, it's a very sad story. There's a very nice post at the Huntington Gardens blog about uh, Hubble and his cat. So, uh, so this is his cat, uh, Nicholas Copernicus. But Hubble was the one who finally resolved this debate. This is a 100-inch telescope at Mount Wilson. It was the largest telescope of the day. And so he was using the telescope to study the Andromeda Nebula. And he was looking at the nebula over and over and over again. So here's the great square of Pegasus. Uh, I cut his head off. Sorry about that. Okay, so he's an upside down horse in the sky, but that's okay because he's a flying horse. Okay. And the back legs of Pegasus are the constellation Andromeda. And if you're away from Chicago, you can see the Andromeda Nebula with your naked eye. It's a little fuzzy patch right there on the sky. Uh, I cannot see it from Evanston. I got to get out like you know halfway from Evanston to to Madison. Oh yeah, yeah. If you go, if you go out past Rockford or you know towards Springfield, just so you're away from the city, if you can see the Milky Way with your naked eye, you'll be able to see the Andromeda. Okay. So this is one of his plates, and Hubble was looking at uh, the Andromeda Nebula all the time, and he knew enough of what it looked like that every now and then something would pop up. And you see that that little line, and it, you probably can't see the dot in this projector from here, but there's a dot that showed up right there. And he's like, that's that's not right. That dot wasn't there before. <laughs> okay, and another one up here between those two dots. And so these, and there's another one. These are novae. So what happens is there are certain kinds of stars that periodically they accumulate material on their surface, maybe from a companion or uh, 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 their gravities sucking stuff down onto the to the surface of the star. And if enough of it builds up, there's kind of a nuclear explosion on the surface of the star. And it blows all of that material off, not enough to destroy the star, but enough to make the star brighter. Okay? And so Hubble was seeing these things in the, in the frames. And he's like, huh, well, I didn't notice that before, but I should probably go check to see if this is on any of my previous pictures. And you'll notice up here, he crossed out the N, and he wrote bar. That was the very first Cepheid variable ever detected in the Andromeda Nebula. Okay? So Hubble, Hubble knew Leavitt's results.
Hubble had been hired at Mount Wilson by Shapley, who was using Leavitt's results to map out the globular cluster. So astronomers were well aware of the power of Leavitt's technique. And he instantly figured out, by looking at its spectrum, by what it's made of, that this was a Cepheid variable. And he used the uh, var Cepheid variable relationship and computed that the Andromeda Nebula was 1.5 million light years away. More than 10 times farther away than they had thought the galaxy was in the past. Okay. Now, we know the distance today is much farther than that. It's 2.5 million. And this has to do with the fact that there were two kinds of Cepheid variables. And he didn't know that at the time. He was using the wrong one. Okay. But this is the first time ever that the universe had been so enormous. And astronomers, up to this point, they had been arguing that there was no way the Andromeda galaxy could be a galaxy because it would have to be these kinds of distances away. But Hubble nailed it down and said, sorry, guys. And so this transforms the way you have to think about the universe. You've got to look at every galaxy now and say, oh my gosh, how far away is it? And you start measuring the distance. This is the Andromeda galaxy as we know it today. If you go look at this through an amateur telescope, you can't see the individual stars, but you can see pictures where you can see these spiral nebulas, which is the decor. This is a satellite galaxy, another galaxy orbiting. Uh, as is this one, just like the Magellanic Cloud orbit, the nebula. The truth is, is that once you recognize that spiral nebulae are galaxies, you will see galaxies that are so tiny in your telescope and so far away, you don't have any hope of ever measuring a star in that galaxy. So this is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Okay, so this is uh, Hubble stared at the same place in the sky for 100 days. Okay. It thought it was an empty place in the sky, and when you develop that picture, you see that there are something like 10,000 galaxies in the picture. And if you look at everything you see here is a galaxy, they, some of them are extremely tiny, and there's no way you're ever going to measure the distance by seeing this ever. Ah, well, so that's a good question. Can we figure out how far away they are? And the answer is, yeah, we can. Okay, so that's the next part of the story, right? What do we do? Okay. In uh, 1912, Vesto Slipher, who was uh, at the Lowell Observatory, uh, he is, uh, should be all of our heroes because he's the guy who hired Clyde Kombach and said, go look for Pluto. And, and so Clyde went and looked for Pluto. Okay? Uh, Slipher was interested in the nebulae. And so this was before we knew they were galaxies. And we were trying to measure everything we could about these nebulae to figure out, are they part of the Milky Way or not? And so what he was doing is he was measuring how fast they were moving. And so the way we do this in astronomy is we use something called the Doppler curve. Okay, so when we look at light, we can see the light from individual atoms. So I've just shown you the example here. This is what helium looks like. And if any of you have uh, done this where you look through the, uh, the spectral uh, glasses at the, the tubes that the volunteers use out when they do like the Aurora table, you will see these sets of lines. Okay? It's a unique fingerprint that completely identifies this as being helium. So if there's something that has helium in it, and that helium's emitting light, and that something is moving towards you, those lines change where they are. They all shift to one side, okay? All together to the blue side, okay? So this red is not exactly where it should be. It's a little bit more towards the blue. And this yellow is a little bit more towards the blue. So they all shift over. And so if you can recognize that this pattern is helium, by measuring the difference, how much it shifts, you can say how fast that object is moving. So this is what Slipher was doing. He was looking at every nebula. He was looking at all the things he could recognize, hydrogen, helium, calcium, whatever it was. I don't actually know what lines he was using. It's typically hydrogen and helium. And he was measuring how fast was the nebulae's moving based on this Doppler effect. And what he discovered was something quite interesting. He discovered that he never saw this happen. What he saw was he saw them all shift the other way, which means they're not moving towards you, they're moving away from you. Every single nebulae he looked at was moving away from him. Milton Hubbison and Edwin Hubble took that idea and using the 100-inch telescope on Mount Wilson, kept measuring 
the distances to spiral nebulae that they could see with Cepheid variables, and then simultaneously measuring their motion. Okay? And what they discovered is that the farther away the galaxy was, the faster it was moving away from it. And so there is a relationship, just like there is a relationship from uh, Leavitt, where if you can measure one property, with Leavitt you just measured the time it took to get brighter and dimmer, you could turn that into a distance. What Hummiston and Hubble discovered is if I just measure how fast the galaxy is moving, I can turn it into a distance. So I don't need to see the Cepheids. All I have to be able to do is measure the redshift. And that's easy to measure. You, you and I can do that in our backyard for all kinds of time. Okay? So this actually leads to the discovery of the expansion of the universe, which is another part of the story we're not going to talk about today. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. That is what we use. Yeah. Right, so, so I didn't put any pictures of the plates in here, but I could show you. But he took the 100-inch telescope at Mount Wilson, right? So your eye, right, you look into a diffraction grain, your eye is at most three millimeters across. And he was using the 100-inch telescope. He takes all that light from the galaxy. That's why you build the big telescope, to take all that light from the galaxy so there's enough of it that you can push through that grating to see the spectrum. That's why we build big telescopes, right? It is why. It's crazy. Okay, but they discovered a relationship that said if I measure this thing, which is easier to measure at greater distances, then I get a measure of the distance. Okay, and the result is we can map out the universe to enormous distances. So this is a modern map. Hubble and Hummison were working, you know, down in this region. This is something called the 2DF survey. This goes out. Uh, I don't know the number off the top of my head. It's something like 6 billion light years, I think. So I'll have to look that number up. I should have looked it up before, okay? But we find that every dot on here is a galaxy, okay? And so the universe is filled with a cosmic web of galaxies. The galaxies themselves are the skeleton, the structure of the universe. And so because you and I live in the future, we can take all that data and turn it into a movie and fly through it, right? So if you get motion sick, you should close your eyes right now. Okay, but let's fly through that data there. And you can see they're just everywhere. And there are voids that we fly through, regions where there aren't very many galaxies, and then regions where they're clustered together. The Milky Way lives in one little cluster called the local group. And then there are great voids that we pass between them. And so each time we pass through one of these clusters, they're linked together in this gigantic cosmic web. Okay? So that's the that's the view that we Okay, so this is how we think of the universe today. We're able to measure the distances enormously far away to things that would have blown Hubble's mind <laughs> in the early 1920s because they had no conception that the universe could be as big as we think it is today. Okay? This, is, this is really the point, right? Our ideas about the size and structure of the universe are constantly changing. Okay, even today, right? I've just told you this whole story about how we know the size of the universe. And, you know, every if you pay attention, every couple of months, cosmologists are like, oh, here's something new we didn't know. And our ideas change constantly. That's the way science works, right? Okay? But this is really the key, right? And this is what I love about this whole game, is that creativity and imagination are really the ways to solving all of these problems. Right? We could have thrown up our hands early on and said, there is no way we are measuring the parallax farther than you know, the nearest star, because a quarter, four miles away is never going to come. We've just given up. But Leavitt came along, and she said, oh, look, there's this other way. And then we could have gotten given up again and said, well, there's no way we're ever going to measure a Cepheid in those galaxies that far away. But Hubble and Hummison figured it out. Right? And so there's always a way through. You never give up because it just takes being clever. I honestly believe that. Everything we're confused about today, we're going to figure it out. A hundred years ago, they're going to laugh at us. They're like, they were confused about that, right? Because when 22nd century brains are thinking about this, it'll be obvious to them that that was the way the universe was put together. Okay? And this is really the cool thing, right? Machines help us make all these discoveries, but this is really the cool thing, right? Is that these are all stories about people. 
And if you go read about Leavitt's story or Hummison, Hummison was a mule team driver who was fascinated by the gigantic big ass telescope they were carrying up the, the mountain. And he decided to stay on at the observatory and worked his way up to being, a, being an astronomer, right? But, and he ended up making one of the biggest discoveries in the history of cosmology, right? So behind all of this, there's all these cool people stories. And that's, that's part of the story. So as always, here's a little bit of reading for you. Um, these are mostly about the galaxy, and um, I'll give you some more about the universe when we talk about dark energy in a couple of weeks. So uh, if you want to read more, you can certainly go uh, dive into the web uh, to, to find uh, books or DVDs. Um, and this, this, this link here tells you all about Herschel's mapping paper. And because it's the Royal Society, there's lots of cool things that they were doing to have paint on it that you can find. So that's all I'm going to say for today. And I'm happy to chat some more. but. Uh, our hour's almost up.